Good afternoon. I'm Paul Pribinow, the president here at Augsburg, and it's a great privilege and pleasure to welcome all of you to this Strauman Speaker Series. The purpose of this series is to enrich student and alumni experience by bringing corporate leaders to campus to share their expertise. Launched about three years ago, the Strauman Series has proven very popular and has attracted, as many of you know, top caliber executive leaders like today's guest, Jim Owens from H.B. Fuller, as well as past guests, Keith Weish, the CEO of Cub Foods, Steve Werenberg, the CEO of Campbell Mattoon, Doug Baker, the CEO of Ecolab, Richard Davis from U.S. Bank, and Chris Polisinski from Land Lakes. The Strauman Speaker Series is a collaboration between the Strauman Center for Meaningful Work and the Augsburg Department of Corporate Foundation and Government Relations. I want to say a special word of welcome to Bob Strauman, whose uh, mother Gladys uh, had the vision to help create the Strauman Center for Meaningful Work here at Augsburg. The Strauman family is such an important part of the Augsburg story. Minnesota is a major center of multinational corporate strength in the United States. On a per capita basis, Minnesota has more Fortune 500 companies headquartered here than any other state. Minnesota ranks 15th in the country in terms of the number of jobs that are tied to exporting goods to other nations. Our base of corporate strength is broad, and the products flowing from Minnesota span many industries, from agriculture and forestry, to biomedical devices, consumer products, to products that are essential for other businesses to operate, adhesives, packaging, paints, and other business essentials. We're fortunate to have such a broad, strong base for our economy. And most of these businesses are homegrown. They began here in Minnesota and have deep roots in the culture and vitality of our state. H.B. Fuller is one of these homegrown success stories. It was started in 1887 by Harvey Benjamin Fuller, who came to St. Paul intending to start a company to sell glue. Many here may remember that it was later led for many years by Elmer Anderson, a beloved Minnesota citizen and former governor of our state. 125 years after it began, H.B. Fuller has grown to become a leading global company focusing on adhesives, sealants, paints, and other specialty chemical products. With fiscal 2011 net revenue of $1.6 billion, H.B. Fuller serves customers in packaging, hygiene, paper converting, general assembly, woodworking, construction, and consumer businesses. H.B. Fuller has grown dramatically and has a broad international presence in 43 countries around the world with operations in China, Southeast Asia, Australia, Europe, Egypt, in the Middle East, Latin America, and many other locations. The company emphasizes that it needs to grow globally and execute be successful. Our distinguished guest tonight, Jim Owens, was named president and CEO of H.B. Fuller Company in November 2010, where he is leading the company's transformation and profitable growth in its targeted markets. He joined the company in September 2008 as senior vice president of the Americas region, directing all aspects of the company's operation in its largest region. Prior to H.B. Fuller, Jim spent 22 years with National Adhesives, a division of ICI, Imperial Chemical Industries, in a variety of management positions in North America and Europe. Jim holds a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from the University of Delaware and a master's in business administration from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Jim will come up in just a moment to offer his uh, remarks, but we're going to start uh, with a video. So welcome to Jim.
Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Jim Owens. Uh, thank you, Dr. Privenel, Bob Strom, and the entire staff here uh, for inviting me to, to, uh, to participate in this, this series. Uh, it's especially gratifying to be here at a university which has such a focus on values and the diversity of culture and to talk about the topic of cult cultural proficiency. Uh, before I get started, maybe I'll tell a little bit more about myself and, uh, and H.B. Fuller. Uh, as, uh, as, as Dr. Pupino said, I, I've, uh, I've worked in the adhesive industry and the chemical industry for 26 years. A lot of those have uh, been traveling internationally since 1990. Uh, lived overseas, spent four years in Europe running a business that had uh, business in Middle East, uh, Africa, including joint ventures in Turkey and Saudi Arabia. And uh, I, I have the honor to, to run the company you just saw about, that, that you just saw that video about. Uh, that's a video we show to, to customers to give a sense of, of what's going on in our company. It's a, it's a company that's about 4,400 employees, 3,000 of them are outside the country. I believe passionately that business is about people. It's the people that make the decisions on how and what you do with your business. And connecting with those people is important. An example of that commitment to connecting with people in the last 24 days, I've spent uh, 14 days outside the U.S. visiting seven different countries. I spent 10 days inside the U.S. visiting 10 different sites so I could connect with the people that exist in our organization. So when I talk about culture and cultural proficiency, having an understanding of all those cultures is important when you, when you want to go and deliver the type of business that we're trying to deliver at H.B. Fuller. The topic of today's subject is cultural fluency and how cultural fluency drives international business. This is an important topic for every person here. As global citizens, as consumers, you have an impact on the world. As future business people, your understanding of culture and cultural proficiency will have an impact on your career, on the company you work for, and also you as a citizen uh, and, and how you impact society. It's a unique responsibility, one that I encourage you to spend some time with. Understand as much as you can about business cultures and behaviors around the world. It'll help you as a business person, and it'll help the organizations you participate. Uh, what I plan to discuss is how lo local execution drives global growth initiatives. In multinational companies and in academic circles, you'll hear the term, think global, act lo local. A lot's written on the strategic global thinking that exists in the world. Not a lot is, is spoken about how to act locally. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. What does it take to succeed by acting locally? Uh, I'll also talk a bit about H.B. Fuller in the context of, the global, uh, of a global, global company, what culture and diversity mean to us in our business, and about cultural proficiency. And then I'll talk about how this drives business. Because at the end of the day, how does this drive the performance of business? How do you make certain that cultural proficiency that exists in an organization enables you to have a capable local team, connect those teams around the world, and make certain that those connected teams take the value propositions which, which exist in your organization and deliver them locally to customers wherever they are around the world? That's the business model we work toward. Companies that try to be too global don't succeed. And companies that try to be too local don't succeed. Getting that balance between being a local and a global company is what really drives success in business. Takeaways today will stand around how do we drive value in companies and how do you, as, a, as an individual, take culture into your life and make a difference in the business environment you're working. First, I want to recognize that it is not possible to be culturally proficient. Uh, no individual could be culturally proficient. The, uh, uh, I, I travel all around the world. I have a real thick passport. I know how to say thank you and hello uh, and goodbye in about 15 different languages, maybe more. Uh, and I am nowhere near culturally proficient. Right? I, I know what snafus not to make in certain, certain countries. Uh, but cultural proficiency is about the ability of an organization to have every person in, in the organization understand first and foremost that differences exist in the cultures that you operate and consider those as you operate 
and also to leverage the cultural diversity which exists within the organization. Because while you can, as an individual, be proficient in the cultures that you work in, as a company, you can be proficient because you have people that operate and work. And if you leverage in all those different cultures that exist, then you'll drive great performance in a company. So what cultural proficiency is, is a company's ability to understand intuitively that cultural differences exist, and because of those, know how to listen and learn from that cultural diversity that exists, and especially the deep learning that exists in certain parts of the organization. Cultural proficiency, I figured I'd share a, a couple of them, how they infect our business. Uh, you know, we sell, we sell lots of adhesives uh, for every manufacturing application you can imagine. One of them is for, uh, for water filtration. So there's, there's a lot of work being done in the world to improve filtration of water, especially in parts of the world where water's not available. Well, the development work to make these massive filtration devices is done in countries like the United States. The production of and, and the specifications of the manufacturing equipment is done in China. And the actual filtration equipment is used in places like Sub-Saharan Africa. An ability to connect those cultures is important to the success of a company like ours. If we have all the right connections with a research group that exists here in Minnesota, but aren't able to translate those to the manufacturer in China so that we win the business, we don't win as a company. So understanding the diversity of needs that exist out there is an important business driver for our success. Another example, we also sell uh, adhesives for baby diapers, right? So, and you might think that uh, baby diapers aren't that different around the world. They're very different around the world. One thing that's different from a cultural standpoint is how we smell babies. So smelling baby in this country might smell like uh, certain baby lotions or baby powders that, uh, that some of you are familiar with. In some parts of Scandinavia and Europe, there should be absolutely no smell in your baby. In other parts of the world, there are all kinds of fragrances and smells. Uh, so, so you're thinking, what kind of smells? No, no, no. Very nice, pleasant smells, I'm sure, in those cultures. Uh, but why is that important for adhesives, you're thinking? It can't possibly have anything to do with adhesives. Well, today there are shortages of certain raw materials that, that, that we use in some of our baby diapers. What we've done is work with our customers to the, the no non-odor adhes adhesive raw materials are being used in places like Scandinavia and the UK. And areas where certain other odors are tolerant, we're masking and putting fragrances in the, in, in other more smelly materials to make adhesives that hold baby diapers together. That's all about an organization that understands the norms that exist. So yeah, we can work with P&G in Cincinnati and develop the best adhesive for the best baby diaper. But when there's challenges out there, understanding the nuances that exist around the world is a real important part of what we need to do as a customer, as a, as a company. This is what we do, uh, and I'll, I'll share a little bit about HP Fuller here for a second. Uh, we develop, produce, and market industrial adhesives. So what does that mean? Well, potato chip bags, insulated glass that helps make uh, homes energy efficient. HP Fuller is an important part of that. Uh, all kinds of packaging applications, construction products, even some of the clothing we wear. You know, if you've got those real thin jackets you wear that are really warm, those are multi-layers of cloth that are bonded with textile, engineered textile adhesives. Lots of different applications. The iPad many of you use, held together with adhesives. The, the HB Fuller really holds together most products that exist in the world. And being able to connect the needs that exist around the world are an important part of our business model. As, uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, HB Fuller has a great history. Started here in the Twin Cities. Uh, we have a growing presence. Uh, a great citizen here in the, in, the, in the Twin Cities. In fact, the former governor of the state Elmer Anderson was our CEO. Uh, the early founders of the company, Dr. Harvey Benjamin, uh, was, developed our first patents, was certainly an entrepreneur, and he formed the company here, actually based on the access to flour that was used in adhesives back in the day. But he was also a visionary in understanding we needed to be a global company. And in 1905, H.B. Fuller was global, with a position in Australia, Germany, and the UK. And since then, and while I wish I had bigger dots, you can see we're in hundreds of locations around the world and, and growing 
uh, including our, our latest factory, which was built in Pune, India this year. Uh, the, uh, the presence we have in emerging places like Egypt and uh, India, along with presence that was established well in the 1980s in Latin America, is a hallmark of who we are. And as I said, about three quarters of our employees work and live outside the United States. This is our street. So, so here's a little bit about who we are. Founded in 1887. There's our headquarters uh, on Willow Lake, which is a, a lake in a 200 acre site that we have. Uh, the company's had a good environmental concern and a focus on, on really giving back to the community for quite a long time. Uh, global reach with presence in 43 countries, uh, but we, we have uh, sales and customers in over 100 countries. And we're listed on the New York Stock Exchange. And if you want a really good investment, you can buy H.B. Fuller stock with the college money you got. Um, so <clears throat> our goal was very clear, crisp and clear, to be the best adhesive company in the world. And uh, you know, while, while there might be some big names you understand in, in the Twin Cities, like General Mills or Best Buy or Cargill, uh, the best adhesive company in the world is being built here in the Twin Cities, and that's H.B. Fuller. Uh, and we differentiate and win in our markets through a few things. One, we focus on our core markets. Two, we invest globally and leverage those investments. Customer intimacy, wherever it is in the world, is an important part of what we do. Innovation and leveraging innovation around the world is critical. And being a great place to work is a mantra that makes us a great company. We have a binder about this thick that lays out our corporate strategy, detail by detail, product by product, customer by customer. When you boil that down, that's our strategy there in five points. And I'll talk a little bit about how culture and cultural proficiency really drive some of that strategy. I mentioned already, hygiene packaging and durable assembly. While these markets seem homogeneous, they're very different in different parts of the world. The needs of babies, the way buildings are constructed, uh, packaging needs that exist around the world changes uh, as we go forward. So while we have a platform to deliver our products, understanding the nuanced needs is critically important. And there's only one way you understand the nuanced needs, and that's having people that are proficient in the local market, and then having people around the world that are listening and learning and respecting those differences. So when I say cultural proficiency, it's about that deep depth within the market, and it's also an appreciation of everyone else in the organization that things are different in different parts of the world. Global investment is critical for us. Deciding where, when, and how to invest. Uh, this is some investment we made in Germany. We have a new technical center and a state-of-the-art facility that we built in China in the upper right-hand corner. Malaysia is an acquisition we made two years ago, as is Egypt. And India, as I mentioned, is a new facility that we just opened up in, in 2012. And, and again, in each one of these situations, an understanding of the local market, an understanding of what, what it takes to win is a key driver in our success. <clears throat> Culture change drives innovation. And, and I'm using an example that's close to home here to help describe what happens. I mentioned earlier that we, uh, we sell adhesives that are used in flexible packaging, things like the, uh, the potato chip bags. Well, a growing trend, certainly in North America and, and in Europe, is the need to recycle, reuse, and recycle. Uh, I have a number here on how many tons of plastic. So, tons and tons of plastic, <laughs> and tons, is disposed each year. And uh, <clears throat> the bag that that gets disposed is actually three layers of film. There's a printable film on the outside, there's an oxygen barrier that keeps the chips fresh, and then there's a small amount of adhesive that's placed in the center there that enables that bag to deliver the results that it wants. And, and one clever company here in the Twin Cities developed a film that would be biodegradable. And they convinced these guys, I guess the lawyers whited out, okay, it's Sun Chips. Um, the, uh, the, the, the people at Frito-Lay to, to purchase this product. And it was, it, was a, it was a boom when they introduced it, right? It t came out on, on Twitter, and uh, it was marketed with a lot of fanfare, and, and sales took off. 
until, and some of you may remember this a couple years ago, right, people started opening the bags. And they'd, they'd, they'd come to an auditorium like this. In fact, I saw somebody with some chips in the back. And, and if they had a bag like this, everyone would know because it was so loud and annoying, right? So you couldn't come to class with chips like this because this is what would happen. Well, at H.B. Fuller, we saw that as an opportunity. We worked with the manufacturer and developed a quiet bag because we were looking out for students at Augsburg College. <laughs> and it's amazing. So you might say to yourself, so what's the difference between these two bags? Anybody want to guess? The adhesive. Same film, same chips, same printing inks, just a different adhesive. And a cultural shift that was happening in one part of the world was a great opportunity because people at H.B. Fuller were sensitive to those changes that were existing. So another one of our drivers I talked about was being a great place to work. Being a great place to work means different things in different parts of the world. So for us, the mantra we have is make this a place where people have the tools, the resources, the teamwork that enables them to work in a great place. And we survey employees around the world to see how they feel. That's how we measure whether or not we're a great place to work. And we don't measure ourselves against other chemical manufacturing companies. We measure ourselves against the best companies in the world. In fact, last year there was a survey, a local survey, of, uh, of top companies to work for in, in Minnesota. And right alongside companies like General Mills and the Mayo Clinic on the top 20 was H.B. Fuller. So, we're delivering some of this, but that's because we're sensitive to the needs that exist for each one of our employees. You know, I'll point to the picture in the, uh, in the center there. So this is a guy in China who's the employee of the month at our Shanghai facility. Got a picture taken with the CEO, recognized his work, being recognized locally. Very, very important and, and prestigious for a person in that culture to have that kind of recognition that he can demonstrate to his colleagues and to, to his, his friends around the world. Lower right-hand corner is a team of people that work together that we call the Thunder Team. And uh, the Thunder Team comes in as a team and they solve customers' projects wherever, wherever they are in Vietnam, Thailand, and uh, parts of Southeast Asia. And they've done some, some great work. But team building and the camaraderie that's important in those cultures is really a lot of what's driven the success. Probably different than the team that we have in Australia that does the same kind of work. The bonding and the way they bond is different. Uh, but also being a great place to work means that people are part of a company that makes a difference. In the lower left-hand corner, our team in Costa Rica was part of, of painting and upgrading a, uh, an old folks home in Costa Rica. And I know community service is a huge part of the effort here at Augsburg. At H.B. Fuller, it's a part of what we do. We, we, we encourage and we give the opportunity for groups of employees to work during what we call Make a Difference Week and to go out and make a difference in their communities. And the, uh, the stories of how people make a, making a difference in places like Costa Rica or Honduras in the upper right hand corner or in China where there's huge opportunities to help uh, families of, of, of immigrants within the country where the, the, the children have, uh, have needs for learning has been a fantastic effort that's happened within the company. So that's our strategy, deliver on those, those, uh, those five things. Uh, so it wouldn't be a good lecture unless I quoted some references uh, in a, uh, but, but some of you who, who've learned a little bit about culture, this is some classic work that continues to be built upon and, and looked at, but Trump and ours and Hampton and Turner define seven dimensions of culture. And, and each culture they laid out on, uh, in terms of universalism versus particularism, which means do the same rules apply in all situations? Um, or are they different according to the circumstances? And um, you know, I think about rules and how that applied to some of the work that we've done. I, you know, we just closed a, an acquisition with a company in Switzerland. And, and it, it was a fascinating process where you know, every deal is a little different. And if you're an American, you especially know that every deal is different. And you especially know that the people on both sides of the table have to connect and build personal relationships. Well, we were negotiating with a Swiss company. Not only a Swiss company, but a bunch of Swiss bankers and Swiss lawyers. Now, in that situation, right, the process and the rules were critically important. 
Personal relationship was less important than our ability to follow the rules, do things the way we needed to on time. It was a little frustrating for, for some of the Americans on the H.B. Fuller team because they wanted to build these, you know, talk about the particulars, and, and the, the, uh, the team on the other side of the table wanted to set up a process that we followed. Once we got the balance right, made certain that the process was defined, did the work up front on, on process development, timeliness of meetings, specifically made certain that deadlines were defined on everything that we wanted as well as what they wanted, the whole process took off and moved smoothly. A great example of understanding and then adapting to the differences that exist with, within, within two different cultures. I, I think of the second one, individualism versus collectivism. So this is whether a country is, is focused on the individual, what's good for the individual, or what's good for us collectively as a, uh, as a team. Uh, and uh, I remember when I, uh, when I first went over to Europe, like, like many people here, uh, as an American, I, I traveled ac across the world, but I'd never really lived in a different culture. Uh, but one of the things I brought to the team I was leading and running the business was a clear sense of individual accountability. Everybody got their goals. Everybody knew what they were accountable for. And in fact, people on the team really liked that I had brought some of that. So, and and we, we built clear accountabilities team by team. Uh, and about a year into the job, I, uh, I asked one of the guys on my team, a Spanish guy, I said, I said so, so how am I doing? How, how are things going? Because I like to get feedback. He said, you know, I really like the fact that we've got this individual accountability. But one of the things we've lost around here is this sense of what the team goal is. So I'm not sure everybody's rallied around the team goal. And it's something that's come with me for since that day to this time, is getting that balance between individual and team goals. And again, that speaks to the differences that exist between a, a very, a much more individualistic society versus one that first looks at the collective needs uh, of the organization. Um, I could go through all these, maybe I'll, I'll tell one more, neutral versus effective. Uh, I, uh, you know, I, I happen to live in the UK but worked all over Europe, but in the UK, and for those of you who travel over there, especially if you do business in, in the UK, it's critically important that you don't listen to what's said. You listen to what's not said. Because it's a, it's a country where things are relatively neutral and not emotional. And, uh, and what's not said is oftentimes more important than what is said. As opposed to when I would go to a, a meeting in Italy where, where people... <laughs> People would, and sometimes it would, you know, it'd start in English and go to Italian. People would be ranting and raising their hands and, you know, just like the things you, you, you might imagine. And, uh, and in some ways, you learn after you work there a while that, that this is part of making certain that people understand how important this is. And, uh, and where people were almost to the point of, uh, of you thought they were going to go at it with each other. Of course, as soon as the meeting ended, right, we'd all be at the coffee machine laughing, everything was fine, right? but very different way to communicate. And understanding the nature of the culture you work in is important. But while seven dimensions of culture and all the cultural training in the world is important, recognize that within a culture, there's plenty of diversity, right? Some of it is internal. You as a person, your age, your race, your income, your ethnicity, your gender. Some of it has to do with your external experiences where you've worked, whether you've had military experience, what part of the country. You know, if you equate it to a culture you know, one that you've grown up with, maybe here in the States or somewhere else, certainly different people from different socioeconomic backgrounds will all call themselves Americans. But culturally, they'll be different. So while a cultural framework is important, recognize that the person you're learning culture from is very different than every other person that exists within that society. So, it's not always possible for you to put your personal assumptions aside, but it's important that you do. Uh, recognize that cultural diversity exists, and as a professional, you need to understand those differences. Uh, it's the ability of a company to leverage those differences that makes, that makes a company great. When you do that, you can build strong local teams. Hiring the right people is what's critical. Um, and, and I think bridging that gap between who your company is or who you are and the culture that you're working in is an important part of making certain you hire that capable local team. Because just because they're local, and they happen to work in Egypt 
or India, doesn't mean they're going to be a great fit for your corporation. Uh, having a person that can bridge the gap is important. And I think back uh, uh, regarding a joint venture we set up in Turkey. Uh, we had to hire a general manager. It was a local Turkish company. And, and our company, we were 50-50 joint ventures. We were hiring a general manager who was going to work, work for both companies and report to the board. What we needed was someone who could adapt to the local Turkish culture and, and win and negotiate locally and connect with the Turkish group that was going to give us all the support we needed locally. But somebody who could work in an international business environment and really drive success. What we found was a guy who spoke French and English, been educated in, in some of the schools there locally, worked for a Swedish and a, an American company in prior parts of his career, understood international business, but was well-rooted and bred in Turkish culture. That's using cultural proficiency, recognizing the differences, and then bringing those differences in to drive the success you need in your business. And I think the point here is you can't be an American company. You know, I, I love it when I travel overseas and people say, oh, yeah, well, we work for an American company. That's a problem, right? Uh, and, uh, and a particularly, uh, and just as it is a problem to be a German company or to be a Chinese company, in a, in a multinational environment, being that global company that can be local when you're local is what's critical. And that's about the people that you have in the organization. One thing we do is give people opportunities to live outside uh, their home country. And, uh, and I encourage anyone who has the opportunity to do that in their business life to take the time to do that. I, I had a, uh, a person who I, uh, was, I, I, I admired who, who uh, actually went over to Europe a few years before me, and, uh, and she lived in Italy. She said, you know, it's great living in Italy, which how can it not be great living in Italy? Um, but she said, uh, she said it's, it's great for a few reasons. One, you know, I learn about Italy, right? And I become part of the Italian culture. Two, I become part of Europe, right? Because you have this diverse European culture that's an interesting place. World. But so all of a sudden, I understand the dimensions of culture that exists everywhere in the world. Another example, we have a guy right now who was, uh, uh, he was a, a missionary for his church in South America. He spent two years down there. He's now running our Latin American business. Uh, 15, 15 days before he got the offer to go down to Costa Rica to live, I met with him and his wife with the little baby in the basket uh, over dinner to talk about it. And... Uh, and they took on the opportunity, and their kids are thriving. The opportunity and the experiences they have as a family that they would have never had to understand a different culture. And he, as a business person, is thriving, understanding and reaching out for ideas that exist all around the world. And, uh, and my own personal experiences, I have, I have four children. They all lived overseas. Uh, when we went overseas, my wife had to get her first passport. My kids had never been overseas. Uh, today, my son just spent the last summer in China. The three of my kids traveled around the world, and all of them, I would say, are much better global citizens. They look at the world differently. So again, I encourage, as business people, to, to create those opportunities for the business, and from a personal standpoint, to take the time, because you can really get embedded and learn about a culture by living around the world. And that's how you build great teams. Leveraging your local strengths is about taking that local team, taking that local capability, and bringing it to your customers. Because at the end of the day, it's about serving customers. Customers pay the bills in business. Customers decide whether they're going to buy that bag of Sun Chips or that iPad, or they're going to buy that adhesive that we're using to produce the baby diaper. We've made uh, significant investments around the world so that we can win with customers. But it's not about taking our answer and just plopping it in. Part of the investment is R&D investment. Uh, Two great examples where we're driving R&D. One is China. I showed you the technical center earlier. Our technology is customized for the Chinese market. One of the big customizations we do is leverage local raw material suppliers. So there's a whole set of international raw material suppliers. But for us to be competitive and aggressive in the local market, finding those suppliers, building their capabilities so they meet our standards, and then using their products in our products, it's an important part of what we do, we wouldn't be able to do that if we didn't invest, A, in people that were local that could connect with those suppliers, and B, invest in having an organization that was tolerant of differences that exist around the world. Uh, same thing's happening with our business in Brazil with our technical team there. But these local teams operating independently would be a problem. If you're going to really leverage the competence that exists in, inside an organization, you have to be able 
to connect those teams that exist around the world. Because you invest in expertise in one part of the world, in the US, say in St. Paul, as we do, we need for that expertise to be able to be brought right to the place it's needed in Malaysia, in India, in Alabama, wherever it's needed around the world, we need to be able to bring that. One of the things we've done is we've cr created global collaboration teams. Everybody doesn't report to one global leader. They work within their teams, in their regions, but they all know who to go to as the source of collaboration and commitment. So representatives from each region, representatives from R&D, finance, procurement, all get together for our core markets. So for instance, hygiene, baby diapers and feminine products. We have a team of people led by one person, representatives from all around the world. They're, they're the source that helps us adapt and change and leverage our skills around the world. Building global collaboration, not global management, is a key strength of what we do to bring those local teams together around the world. So cross-cultural understandings. Uh, when in Rome, do as the Romans, right, uh, is an important message. Um, paying attention and doing your background work before you go to another country is important. Um, and, and, uh, and recognizing the little things make a big difference is important. And one of the things you'll find if you, if you go to Japan, lots of Japanese will shake your hand. And that's because they're culturally sensitive. They know you're an American. They'll come and shake your hands. But a good thing to do would be to bow to your Japanese host, which is a great thing to do. However, if you get it wrong, it could be a problem because the bowing is important in terms of, particularly if you're with someone of higher status, you should be bowing a little lower than that individual bows. So understanding the nuances of how to give someone a card in China with both hands and take the time to read it, understanding how to bow if you're gonna to decide to bow in China is an important part of what you'll do to represent yourself and to make those cultural uh, connections. You don't have to understand every nuance, but being sensitive, open, using a couple local words, all send a message that, you know what, I'm, I am culturally sensitive. Our organization is building a level of cultural proficiency. Uh, the picture on the right, I love this picture. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a picture that, that of, of the the uh, opening ceremony that we had at our India plant in, uh, in Pune. So we honored the, the local rituals and traditions. As you know, in India, nature and honoring traditional rituals is important. Uh, by having a, a certain feast performed in a certain, certain way uh, with the appropriate uh, local leaders. And, uh, and the guy on the left in the suit and the tie is a Scottish guy with a pretty strong brogue. Who, 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 in a very serious way, made certain that we honored the local traditions. In fact, he's probably one of the most culturally sensitive guys we have in our organization. He understands the nuances. Of course, you might not know that by the suit and tie in, in 110 degree weather. But, uh, uh, but I can't say that it was all because of this, but it's very difficult to finish a factory on time. Our team finished the factory on time, on budget, delivering exactly what we expected. Not sure it was the ritual, but everything that went around the ritual, sensitivity, understanding the norms, understanding what it took to get things done through the local bureaucracy in India, all made a big difference in our ability to deliver the results we did with that facility. Bringing all that together for a local value proposition is very important. So what is a value proposition? It's a clear, concise statement of the products and services that, that you bring. Uh, it, we appeal to customers and their decision makers in the right way in terms that they understand. And it articulates why a consumer should buy your adhesive or whatever product it is you have. And it should convince the customer that your product you're offering will add more value or solve a problem better than anyone else's. Um, so yeah, you have to have a great product, but the value proposition, what it brings to them is important. Now if you have a different set of cultural norms, the value proposition probably needs to be defined a little differently. I can think of one great example where a former company I worked for developed some adhesives that, that were performing at lower temperatures. So in this one application, all the traditional products were 350 degrees Fahrenheit and uh, 175 degrees uh, uh, C. And, and this new product was 250F. So much lower temperature, had energy savings, safety benefits. 
and around the world it was taking off. We we're getting customers to try it. Customers knew intuitively why it was, why it was valuable. I mean, it was 100 degrees lower and did everything it needed to do. And uh, great success launching this new product, except in Germany. And we couldn't analyze, couldn't figure out exactly why we weren't succeeding in Germany. Well, in Germany, if you've got a strong value proposition, you better not just tell somebody about it. And even if it's intuitive, if you just tell them about it, you're not going to get it done. You need the data, the support, the documentation that allows you to move forward. So yes, we had the value proposition, but we weren't able to define it in terms that enabled us to influence the decision makers. And uh, once we figured that out, we were able to change things in, in Germany. Um, here's a couple examples. You know, it's easier to understand consumer goods and adhesive examples, although I think I got it with the baby diaper one. Um, but, uh, but here's a couple products that are out there in the, uh, in the market. So uh, these are the guys at Whirlpool. They're developing a special, uh, a, a special washer for, for India. And uh, what's special about this wa washer? Well, if you, if you know the Cyrus, they they're like five feet long, right? You put that in a washer or dryer, it's never going to work. So how are you going to get a family, you know, middle, upper income family to buy a washer if you, can't, if you can't dry and wash that? Well, they put a special compartment that enables the, the local garments to be, to be washed and dried in the dryers. Uh, in China, the, uh, a beautiful color, if you're going to buy and invest a lot of money in a, in a new refrigerator freezer, you don't want it to be white or stainless steel. You want it to stand out. And what a local manufacturer figured out, if I can get it to stand out with blue or red or yellow and be a centerpiece, boy, I can sell a lot more washers and dryers. And then for those of you who are trying to sell microwaves, especially in the UK, if you want to microwave things like bacon or french fries, you better have a microwave that makes it crispy, right? Then I'm going to put up with that soggy taste that we get with microwave food. And microwave manufacturers develop that. I think three good examples of adapting a product for local needs that exist in, in, uh, in the appliance industry. So thinking, thinking globally, acting locally, key enablers that make that happen. You do need that winning global strategy. Didn't talk much about that, but you need a global strategy. Where are we going to win? How are we going to win? Which markets are we going to operate in? That's the think globally part of the business. The act locally part starts with a culturally proficient organization, one that understands intuitively the differences exist and then leverages the, the knowledge and the experience that exists within the business to create a very strong team, a stream, the team that meets the needs of your organization, that connects those teams that exist in Malaysia, India, China, US, as part of one big organization, and then customizes local solutions. Taking that team, very capable, connecting them around the world, and then doing something different as, about, as a result of those to bring solutions to customers. And has a big impact on your organization. First off, you spend less time managing internal issues and more time focusing on customers. It allows better teamwork. And teamwork, as we all know, whenever you work in, in a team, really in a team across the world, better ideas come out. And execution is faster when, team, when people are operating in teams. So when you can create powerful global teams, these two things happen all the time in the business organization. It makes your customer support, whether that's technical support or service or sales support, more efficient, more cost efficient, because we're able to move faster. We delight customers because we respond to their needs and their culture. And we're efficient in those responses. It's lower cost when you have local teams that can adapt a solution than trying to figure out how to get a message halfway around the world and then get the solution halfway back around the world to the customer that's, that needs it. And marketing and technical organizations can do more with less. If they come up with platforms that can be customized locally, that's a lot more efficient than trying to come up with one product and one answer that's going to work in every culture and every country around the world. Customizing by market, not a one-size-fits-all answer for all countries. And, uh, and finally, I'd say 
In terms of the economic impact, it's important. It's critically important in business. For each one of you, you're going to have a career somewhere and you're going to work in a, in a business environment. Being culturally proficient will make you a more valuable asset to the company you're in. It'll also enable you to lead the changes that have to happen in the, in the company you work for. Uh, and finally, it's fun, right? It, it's a lot of fun to understand different cultures, to use your curiosity and understand the diversity that exists out there. So thanks for your time today, and I'd really like to open the floor to any questions you might have. So. In your organization that, that can be non-viable standards, right? For us, ethics is a huge one, and, and the, the complete non-acceptance of any kind of bribery or, or, um, or payments or facilitation payments that exist. Uh, there's a certain level of standard that's set within publicly listed companies. We go beyond that in our code of conduct. We have monthly training all employees need to cover. Uh, we've translated that into multiple language, to every language around the world. So, uh, and in fact, we just found a situation where we, we set up a joint venture in Turkey, and some people there didn't speak any of the nine languages that we had the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the instructions in. So we've added a process to, to translate it into Turkish for those people while we try and make certain that they build the English skills to take the training. Uh, but there are certain things that are, that, that are who you are, right? So cultural diversity is about adapting to the cultures that exist, but there are standards that exist. We have safety standards. We have environmental standards. We have, as a culture, a huge focus on doing the right thing for the customers for the long run. And uh, we certainly have very high levels of ethics standards. And, uh, and, and you, just, you just say no, right? You, you, you have to walk away from business. You don't enter markets as quickly as you would otherwise. Uh, fortunately for us, a lot of our business starts with multinational customers. Those customers set a standard. And, uh, and the message you have to give people, especially when you acquire a new business where some of these practices have, have, uh, have existed, is that if you don't stand up for what's right, the world won't change. So yeah, do we pass away some dollars and lose some money as a result? Absolutely. But that's short-lived, right? By helping the world reach a different level of standards, then, then you help the whole, place be a bit, the whole world be a better place. So, so that's how HB Fuller handles it. I'd say probably most of the reputable companies and in the Twin Cities have that same standard. Uh, I think there's a difference, though, between having the standard and going out there and executing to the standard. There's plenty of companies that have it. Uh, you know, for us, it's an important part of our value set. Um, for other companies, I think it's a part of what they do, but you've you got to be careful not to be having a blind eye to what's happening out there. And, uh, so great question and uh, an important part, not just on the, on the ethics piece, but on lots of other issues that exist in your business. Yeah, you want to adapt to the culture, we have a company culture that has a strong force above beyond that. So thanks for that question. Thanks for the presentation. I have no idea how global HP Fuller was. So when you're hiring, how do you think about how much cultural fluency a person needs to already come loaded with or how much you expect them to train? Yeah. So I think we all come with a level of cultural diversity, right? So we certainly know our own culture. Uh, so if you're asking about uh, people in the, in the U.S., I think we're looking for openness more than cultural diversity. Uh, we, we hire people that we think have a certain value set, um, certain level of teamwork, certain level of curiosity and openness. If you're curious, open, have a good set of personal values and a high work ethic, you can become culturally proficient and culturally, culturally diverse. So, uh, so, and it depends on the job, right? If it's a job where we're going to need you to travel around the world, obviously we need some adaptability. But I would say, no, we don't look for it to be built in. It's great, right? If somebody comes and they've, oh, yeah, I've traveled overseas or I have a real interest in being part of a global organization, that's a plus, even if the job they're, they're hiring for is a, a local one in Germany or a local one in, in North America. Um, so that would, be, that would be a short summary. But certainly not a standard we put on every person who comes in. But those characteristics of curiosity, work ethic, set of values, those are things that we, we sort of expect out of everyone we hire. I'm curious about your timeline. So you have an interest in establishing a business in a certain country, and then you're ready to go. What kind of patience and work and timeline do you have in this Good question. I wish my team was here. They could answer it better than me. 
Um, because I'm not very patient about these things. You know, I think, I think you've got to get started on these opportunities. So, uh, but maybe I'll use a couple of, uh, of examples. Um, so in the case of Egypt, uh, P&G had just installed a facility there and put together a round table opportunity. We moved very quickly on acquiring the business that was, that was there because we knew it would leverage us with one of our major customers who'd asked us to put some resources there. And that was less than a year. Now, the last couple of years, we've had to make a lot of investment. We had to upgrade some of the standards in terms of how they operated the business. Uh, but we moved very quickly on that case. In the case of Indonesia, you know, we've been talking now for two and a half years. Uh, we've, we've done a, a deep dive on all the acquisition candidates, small companies that are out there. But corruption is more of a problem in a place like Indonesia. I went personally, met with some government officials, met with other multinationals. So we're moving a little slower because we want to get it right. And, and build a business that can move to the standards. Not because we want to move slower, but because we're, we're taking the steps to do it, do it right. Uh, so it varies country to country. But I would say, generally, if we set out to do it, within 12 months, we've got something started, maybe 24 months. And then from there, the acquisition either happens or, or the Greenfield facility happens 12 to 18 months later. So it's a three-year event, something like that. When you're hiring local That's a, uh, that's a fascinating question. And I don't know that I have a good answer generally uh, about that. So uh, I look at, uh, so, so I would say generally a bit. You know, certainly in the US, we do a great job of it. When you look at our business in Europe, which is very mature, we have people from lots of ethnic backgrounds and, and varied, uh, varied experiences. If I look at our team in, uh, in Malaysia, and you know, Malaysia is a, com a country with a very diverse lot of, you know, we have Malay, we have Chinese, we probably have a, a group that's, that's pretty broad based. Uh, so generally I would say yes. Uh, the leaders locally drive a lot of who we hire and if there's probably too much tension, it, you know, it's something you have to mature into as an organization. So I wouldn't say we go in and say we're gonna get in the country and we're gonna be as diverse as we can within the the value set that we have there. We really look for leaders in an organization that allows us to connect globally and win locally. And then from there, I think the natural maturity of having a company that's value-based, that respects diversity, leads to this environment. Um, it gives us a lot of uh, gender diversity. We have, we have three women on our executive committee, and it gives us a lot of cultural diversity when you have a very accepting culture like the one we have at, uh, at HP Fuller. Uh, James, your presentation focused a lot on importance of being sensitive to both the group of users and to the business community. Can you share a time in which your team wasn't sensitive to a group of users and then the results that happened when you came up with a product or a solution? Sorry, I can't. We always are sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let, me, let me think. I didn't come up with losing. Yeah, I mentioned the German one. So that was, a, uh, that was an opportunity where we, we, we really, uh, where we really got it wrong. Um, think of a solution. Yeah, we, ha we have one that's going on right now. We have a, uh, a, a great pro So we have a, a raw materials drive a lot of our business. We, we have a leading position in packaging adhesives around the world. And uh, we've developed a, a cutting edge technology that leverages some, some in-house proprietary technology that we've developed along with uh, an ability to manage a raw material shortage that exists. And, uh, and we launched it globally. So we came up with it here locally, and there's a big need around the world to have this kind of a product, and we went forward with a very thoughtful global launch. So, ignoring a little bit of some of our cultural proficiency, what we didn't recognize that is in the packaging market, so packaging is things like General Mills, right, where they'll seal cases, or, or uh, Coca-Cola, or any kind of good that, that's sealed in a package. Uh, in the U.S., where we did most of the beta testing, it's on very high, high speed, high precision lines. Well, in lots of parts of the world, the, the level of compression and the, the softness of the packaging is very different than what exists here. 
And early on, some of our colleagues around the world were concerned about some of these, these issues. And some of the people that were part of the, the, the team you know, said, well, these guys just need to get on board. This stuff clearly works. So it's a good example where we weren't as sensitive to the local needs early on. Now we've come around, we've understood it, and we're developing uh, products that meet the needs. But it's a great example where packaging is not packaging. So even though Coca-Cola exists in China and in, in the US, uh, very different the packaging lines that exist and the way they, they operate the, uh, the machinery. And uh, we could have done a better job in the early stages of developing the product. But do you uh, tend to keep your uh, AC cooler name around the world, or when you go in partner, do you tend to stay down the local identity and go with that name and operate as a tool? Yeah, so I would say HB Fuller branding, as some people said they didn't know so much about HB Fuller, is something we can work on as a company, both here and abroad. Uh, because we want the HB Fuller brand to be equated with the best industrial adhesive company in the world. So we're leveraging the brand everywhere, um, and we're doing a better job of that. But yeah, when we partner with somebody, we tend to try and drive the HB Fuller brand. Uh, some cases where that doesn't make sense, but almost totally it's, it's the HB Fuller brand. I, I think it, it does a couple things. One, we have a lot of multinational customers, so that means something around the world. There's also an employee brand that, that has value in terms of of what we do in the communities and what we do to make the place a great place to work. Uh, Mr. Owen, thank you for your presentation. Um, I noticed when you put up the map that you didn't have anything in Africa. Is that some place that you have as a goal or an opportunity that you see that you're investing? Yeah, so uh, it's a, uh, it's, it is a great opportunity. So we, we do have a facility in Egypt, so that's in Africa. Um, but. Uh, but, and we do do a, a lot of export sales, mostly to the northern countries. So a lot of opportunity today in Nigeria and Algeria. A lot of that come, gets imported from France. Uh, there's, there's no local manufacturing in those facilities today. Uh, I would say for us, South Africa or, or somewhere near South Africa and Nigeria would be opportunities, probably not in the next two or three years, but probably in the next five to, five to 10 years. Uh, as those economies mature and, and local production matures. Uh, so yes, but probably five or, five or 10 years off. You know, we need a facility in Brazil first. I'd really like to see us get a position in Indonesia. Uh, we also don't today, as a, as a global company, have a position in Russia. So those would probably be first on the list, and when we check those off, probably the, the economies will mature a bit in, in some African countries for us to develop. I think I heard you say that the significant part of the R&D happens in the States. Do you see that continuing, or do you see problems on the horizon over the next decade or so? So our corporate center is here in the States, but a significant of our part of R&D does happen around the world. So we have technology centers in Lunenburg and in Shanghai, and then we have local labs in other parts of Europe and, and Latin America. And what we try and do is create centers of expertise so that these labs aren't just uh, sort of pilot labs. So I think our, our center will always be here in the Twin Cities, likely, or at least for, for the foreseeable future. But building a stronger competence in China is an important part that enables us to build and leverage competence there. Also allows career development for our teams there. So today they localize products, but in the future there'll be a center of expertise. And likewise in Germany, some of the centers of expertise exist today for us in Europe. So uh, yeah, I see it as, but, it, but it's critically important that that we, we know how to localize and that those centers are connected around the world. And in today's world, it's easier and easier to connect those global teams. It also gives you the opportunity to actually do R&D work around the clock. When there is that very urgent, important project, teams can transfer projects around the world to keep the, uh, the R&D moving at pace. So, uh, but long term, I think R&D is, is going to be an important part of what we do here. I am reading
regulate hours, people work, etc. Do you run into that? Is it something that, like the not bribing, not going with corruption, that you kind of export from the American H.P. Fuller way of doing things? So, a few questions built into one there. So. Uh, First off, uh, it's great you're reading Elmer's uh, memoirs. He's a fascinating, fascinating man. I, I had the privilege of going to his posthumously, his, his 100th birthday. And when you look at all the things he did in his life, H.B. Fuller was a small part of what, what this person did for this, uh, for this community and, and really for the world at large. At, at Fuller, this great place to work thing is something we are definitely building in every part of our business. It's a, uh, we think it's a competitive advantage. You know, when you think about, you know, people talk a lot about how difficult it is to retain talent. One of the things that's going to enable us to retain talent is being a great place to work. That means different things in China. There are certain elements of face, title, promotions that have to happen at different pace and a different way than it has to happen here. So we need to adapt, but being a great place to work is important. Working in the communities, critically important part of what we do, and, and driving that around the world is something uh, with Kimberly Sinclair's help, who's been here, we're trying to do a lot more of, taking more uh, of, of our dollars, but also expecting employees to do more work. And they love that, right? It's, it's, it gives a sense of pride. Even in places like Europe, where it's a little countercultural to be, you know, where, where you have more social nets to be doing community work, it takes a little while to convince people we should do it. But once they get rolling with it, it's, uh, it's pretty powerful in terms of, uh, in terms of what it does. As far as the reputation of American companies, I think that reputation exists more in this country than it does abroad. I think generally, generally, we can't speak for all of them, uh, American companies uh, sp speak to a higher standard as they go around, around the world and, uh, and bring a level of expectations. Certainly wouldn't say that's true for every company, but, uh, but, uh, but I think a lot of reputable companies do try to, to manage to that. And then what happens is, the exceptions or the things they didn't manage well is what hits the press and gets, gets a lot of exposure. But, but you know, it, I'm CEO now for 16 months. And, uh, you know, I, I look at, at, at how we characterize sometimes in the press or in, in various communities, the business community. The business community and, and most of the business leaders that you'll never read about or see on 60 Minutes are deeply committed to making a difference in society making a difference in the communities they work in, making a difference around the world. These are people that are not in it for personal gain or money. They're in it to make a difference. And they're doing that around the world. So, uh, uh, so I would say a lot of companies do it. But for us, we see it as a core part of who we are. And, uh, and Elmer certainly set a great example. I, you know, I, this is the second time I got asked this question today. Um, so uh, this first one was by uh, somebody who's working on some cultural workforce. Uh, you know, I, I, I think, uh, uh, so my own personal, uh, you know, values are do the right thing, which I learned from my grandfather, and work really hard, which I learned from my mother, pay off. And I think generally in life, those are, those are a couple values you want to take, right? Do the right thing. We know what that means. It means don't work too much for the short term. Build a long-term view, whether that's in your personal finances or your personal relationships. Uh, work hard every day, uh, and good things happen when you do that. Uh, so, you know, I was never, I didn't start with an ambition to be a CEO. Came from humble means, uh, but started with a good set of values, supportive family, first person in my family to go, to go to university, and then learned from the people around me. You know, I'd go to lectures like this, talk to people who uh, were in influential jobs, Tried to suck in something from every uh, every interaction that could make me a better person, and um, and then I'm CEO of, of a great company with a great tradition. So uh, that's uh, that's that's sort of how I got here. What specific uh, tools and strategies are you using to connect your teams locally? Um, globally, globally, and locally. Yeah. So I'll talk about the you know, locally. It's a lot easier, right? Teams can get together. Face to face is important to connect teams. So if teams want to connect. You, you, there's all kinds of virtual tools, but early on, making certain that they meet face-to-face -face as a team, the whole team is there and they dedicate time to it, is critically important. Because 
you create personal connections, they get to know each other and do those things. So when a team forms, getting them together face to face, high expense needs to happen. Um, and then do that regularly. So maybe the first year a team forms, they need to meet a global team twice a year. After that, at least once a year and maybe a couple times a year. And it's, it's part of the cost of doing business. You know, people try and cut those costs out because there's all kinds of electronic tools. Electronic tools don't build that human interaction. But once the teams are established, telephone conference calls, video conference calls, uh, you know, giving people access to, to tools as they come available. You know, I had a situation where I had to be away for a very important meeting and uh, somebody hooked me up with FaceTime. So I'm FaceTiming with my CFO to communicate to outside, uh, outside investors. So uh, we, have, uh, we also have SharePoint, which is a, a collaborative web-based site. We're leveraging that as a universal tool that allows us to, uh, uh, to really communicate as an internal company. Uh, we do town halls on a regular basis. Global one we did today with the whole organization around the world connected via, uh, via uh, internet connections and, uh, and telephone. And, uh, and we have video watch messages. So lots of communication. When you're trying to build a connected team, building those communication methods are important. So, so WebExes, conference calls, and then uh, electronic media, once people connect face to face. So, OK. Thanks, everyone. Oh my heavens, this potato chips are falling out. <laughs> um, Jim, it's been great to have you here. We thank you for your time and for sharing your wisdom and experience. We want to uh, induct you as an honorary Augie. So we All have right. You actually don't need it this time of the year. That'll serve you well for next fall, probably. But uh, thank you so much for really being with us and for everything that you shared with us. Very nice. Thanks for the time.